Thank you. It's a great honor to be here at the Grand Master Class Big Question. I'm going to address today the loss of creativity, which is appropriate to the theme of the age of loss for this overall conference. But more important, I also want to discuss how we regain creativity. These are challenging times. If you look at the economic growth in the United States and Korea, they have peaked. The gross domestic product and growth peaked 10, 15 years ago. So in 2013, your president decided on a change in economic policy, calling for a move from a manufacturing economy to a knowledge economy. What is such a knowledge or innovation economy made of? Well, here are two definitions. An economy in which innovation and growth are dependent on the quantity, quality, accessibility, sharing, and transformation of the information available, rather than on the means of production or manufacture. Another definition is that it's an economy based on the integration of emerging radical technologies with creative individuals, small groups, and companies organizing in interlocking networks, connecting and disconnecting, constantly in a process of continuous innovation. So the question is, is Korea well positioned to make this move from a production to a knowledge economy? Next slide. On the surface, yes. Korea is ranked number one in industrial in innovation by Bloomberg Business Weekly magazine. Korea is at the very top of the PISA scores, which measure student success in language, math, and science. Next slide. And it's top of the TIMS test, another set of international tests looking at student proficiency in science and math. But Korea's strengths are also its weaknesses. The transition requires something different. Manufacturing economies rely on a uniformity of thought and efficiency. Strong cultural values, which certainly Korea has. Standardized education to support that efficiency. And all of these have supported Korea's unequaled education and economic growth. But, Creative and knowledge economy requires non-conformity, flexibility, inefficiency, and constantly relearning and unlearning throughout life. It's a totally different type of education. Now, I'm not the only one who's saying these things. Keith Sawyer, whose name you may recognize because he has been in Korea many times in the last couple of years, has written several books that have been translated into Korean, has also concluded that Korea's emphasis on things like the PISA scores and TIM scores are undermining its creativity. Korea is also poorly ranked by Richard Florida. Richard Florida is one of the major economists who is talking about and forming these new innovation economy theories. He has four ways of evaluating whether a country can make that transition. They are technology, talent, tolerance, and territory assets. Now, in technology, Korea is ranked number one, but only within country patents. Korea does very poorly at innovating worldwide. In terms of talent, Korea is ranked 10th in capital, human capital, 13th in scientific talent. It has one of the lowest number of creative economy type people, class workers. In terms of tolerance, 
very important that a new economy support people who are different, who think differently and act differently. And Korea does not rank well in this. It's 34th. One of the worst problems being that women who make up a potentially large part of a creative workforce do not have opportunities here as in many other countries. And in terms of territory assets, which involve the overall support for entrepreneurship, there is a great deal of money available, but very little human and social support. So when you look at Korea, there's a tremendous amount of money in R&D research and development being put in, more than any other country in the entire world. And that's on the left, but on the right, you can see that the actual growth in number of new innovations and patents is not increasing. The money is not taking care of the problem. The problem as Alvin Toffler has pointed out, he's one of the great studiers of the future, a futurologist, has said, is that what we need is a new kind of education in which literacy is not measured by how much you know, but how quickly you can learn, unlearn, and relearn. So in a knowledge economy, it's not what you already know. It's not how well you're doing on these tests, but how fast you can relearn something new, innovate, and adapt. Now, the Korean government understands this, as do the people who are trying to think about a new education. This is one example which I found there are changes in the national curriculum, changes in schools making them more diverse, a STEAM initiative which adds arts into the science, technology, engineering, and math curriculum, and changes in the way students are chosen and can apply to colleges and universities. People often ask me, will these do the job? I don't know. I don't know enough about the actual ways they're being implemented. So what I want to focus on for my talk today is my version of what creativity and STEAM could potentially be. So I'm going to ask a number of questions and then try to answer them for you. What is creativity? Why is creativity rare? How, much, how must education change in order to stimulate the creative economy and the potential of the Korean people in general? And what can you personally do, regardless of what changes are or are not made in the general system? And why, in particular, are arts important for understanding and learning science, technology, engineering, and math education? So let's start with some myths, myths about creativity. One is that creativity is an innate personal trait. I call this the Mozart myth. Creativity should be easy, another myth, which I call the inspiration myth. A third, that intelligence is it's correlated with creativity, which you could call the genius myth. Fourth, that creativity is problem-solving, that you produce something, it's what you make in the end, the production myth. Fifth, that creative people are experts, which I call the expert myth. And sixth, that creative people are therefore identified early because, of their, because they are prodigies. We know people are creative because they start early and show their promise. I call this the prodigy myth. Here for me is the reality of creativity. Creative people are born, are not born, sorry, they are trained. Creativity is a process requiring hard work and persistence, not inspiration. Intelligence is virtually irrelevant. The experience 
that you have in your life is the key. Creativity is problem generating, problem raising, challenge raising, not production driven. And creative people are persistent novices, beginners, not experts. And finally, the creative people are therefore idiosyncratically trained, polymaths, strangely trained people, trained in more than one field, whose abilities may not be obvious until after they have made their major contribution. So let me go through these myths. The first was that geniuses are prodigies, prodigies which I called the Mozart myth. Now that's after the fact that Mozart started composing when he was only five, and by the time he was ten, he was writing entire symphonies. How many people can do that? But let me look at a story of real creativity. This involves someone that no one thought was creative, and it was told to me by a man who started out life as a teacher and then became the first dean of the College of Arts at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. This man had students in very young grades. He was teaching them how to read. And in order to help them read, he believed it was good to have them tell stories. It helped consolidate their understanding of language. So every day when he started class, he said, tell me a story. Who wants to volunteer and tell me a story? And almost every day, students would raise their hand and they'd tell stories. But there was one little boy who wouldn't. He would never raise his hand. Jack Morrison, who was the teacher, did everything he'd think of to get this little boy to tell a story. The little boy would not. This went on for weeks. Jack Morrison cajoled, he heckled, he embarrassed the little boy. He did everything he could think of to make him tell a story, but he would not. And then one day, something very interesting happened. A little girl got up and she told a story of the cat who learned to play the piano. Curious cat jumped up on the piano, ran up and down the keys, plink, plank, plonk. And that's how the cat learned how to play the piano. Well, the next day, the little boy suddenly raised his hand. Jack Morrison, the teacher, was thrilled. Finally, the little boy was going to tell a story. And with great anticipation, the entire class waited to hear what it would be. And the little boy repeated, word for word, the little girl's story about the cat who had learned the piano. Not very impressive. But Jack Morrison was thrilled because finally the boy had made a breakthrough. He was telling stories. The next day, the little boy raised his hand and he told the story of the dog who learned to play the piano. And the next day, the boy raised his hand and he told the story of how the rabbit played the piano. And the next day, the boy raised his hand and he told the story of how the squirrel played the piano. And this went on week after week after week until Jack Morrison didn't want to hear the stories anymore. And no one in the class wanted to hear the stories anymore. And instead of clapping and praising the little boy, they were bored, they were tired. And the little boy probably picked up on this because he ran out of animals and all of a sudden started telling the story of how the kitten played the piano. And then the puppy who played the piano. And the baby rabbit who played the piano. And the little chicken who played the piano. And on and on and on for weeks and weeks and weeks until everybody was bored. And they started making fun of the little boy. And he knew that there was something wrong, but this was the only story he knew. Now, at the very end of the year, Jack Morrison always had a competition, the ultimate challenge. Every student was to tell the best story that they knew, and the class would vote 
as to what the best story was. And everybody knew that the little boy was not creative because all he could do was tell the same story over and over and over. The little boy knew this too. So what was he going to do? He waited, he waited. Everybody in the not trust the class told their story. He was last. And probably out of desperation, this is what he did. He told the story of how the grand piano taught the baby piano how to play. And the teacher was thrilled, and the students were thrilled, and they clapped and they voted this the best story of the year. So here was a little boy who not only wouldn't tell a story, and who everybody thought had no creativity, who in fact was the most creative in the class. Not only that, but he changed everybody's view of things. When I heard this story, I started going around and I looked at everything in big and little and I started thinking, do big basketball hoops teach little basketball hoops how to play basketball? Do big rain clouds teach little ones how to rain? Think about it. Everything in the world all of a sudden looks different. So here are the creativity lessons. You never know who's going to be creative. Creativity depends on a learned process. Jack Morrison created the conditions for that learning. Creativity is a response to a unique problem. And the poor little boy had a problem. How could he be different? It requires a supportive environment, which Jack created. Everybody listened to everybody's stories. Even when they were bored, he still let the little boy try and try and try. And it relies on a responsive audience. The audience learned over the course of the year what a good story was and how to be surprised and when something was novel and interesting. And finally, creativity is transformative. That story makes me see the world differently. I'll never think about things the same. All right, myth number two. Creativity should be easy. Wait for inspiration. And then the muse will tell you what your great idea is. Let me tell you a story, a true story, about creative loss and inspiration. When I was a young professor, one of the first classes I taught was at UCLA. It was on the creative process, and virtually everyone who took the class thought that they either weren't creative or had lost their creativity. Make me creative, they said. Well, I didn't know whether I could do that. And one of the most challenging students was a young man who at the age of 18 had written a song for a rock band which had become an international hit. The band obviously went back to the boy and said, write us another one. Four years later, he was in my class because he could not write another song. Make me creative, he said. Well, he had fallen prey to the Mozart myth. He told me that when he wrote his first song, that he had just had this inspiration, sat down one night and wrote the whole thing. Mozart supposedly did this as well. But what people don't understand is that Mozart had a perfect memory for everything he thought in music. So when he wrote out his music, he could remember all the variations and write it perfectly. Almost no one can do that. What I taught my class was that, in fact, creativity is hard work. On the left are notebooks from Dylan Thomas, a Welsh poet. You can see all the crossing out. He never wrote anything down, which he published. Most of it he threw away. On the right is one of the manuscripts from Beethoven, certainly as great a composer as Mozart, and you can see that almost all of it is scratched out. He worked, rewrote, rewrote, rewrote. Nothing came easy. So I told the student, go back and think about what your creative process it is. How did you write that hit song? And when he went back, what he found was that he had written music 
that went into this song for six months. He'd forgotten all about that. And the big problem he had in writing this song was that he actually had two themes. So, in a sense, two heads trying to come together. And he couldn't make them work. He knew that if he could put these two things together, he'd come up with something really interesting and original, but he couldn't make it work. And then one night, it all fit. And that was the only night he remembered. So he thought he wrote his whole song in one great inspiration. And that's not what happened at all. Once he realized that he had to work and work and try and throw things away, he started writing again. And by the end of the class, he actually played for us what would become his next great hit music. So the creativity lesson here is very clear. As Thomas Edison, probably the United States' greatest inventor said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. You don't wait, you just get down to work. The second lesson is that we need to make the creative process itself a center of peace of our education. Right now we hide that creative process. You go to a museum and you see the end product, beautiful pictures, you hear the compositions of a Mozart and you don't know the hard work that went into it. The only way to become creative is to emulate creative people. And if they hide how they do it, none of the rest of us can benefit. So we have to make it explicit. All right, myth number three. You have to be a genius to be creative. If you've read my book, Sparks of Genius, you've heard this story, so I'll go through it fairly quickly. But I went to Princeton University with lots of very smart people. But while I was there, one of them was a student I'll call John, not his real name, who was considered the smartest student who'd been at Princeton in 50 years. When the rest of us were getting 52% of the questions right in organic chemistry or physics class, John got 100%. He was truly a genius. But he had a flaw. And I found that out one day when we walked out of the physics building after I'd gotten my 57% on a test and John had got 100%. And John pushed on the door and it didn't open. He pushed on the door and it didn't open. I pushed on the door and it opened very easily. John looked at me and said, how did you do that? And I laughed and said, very funny, John. We just studied the principle that governs that on the test where you just got 100% and I just got 57, so don't play games with me. He said, I'm not kidding, I don't understand how you opened the door. I looked at him, really? And he said, no, I really don't understand. So I said, where did I push on the door? The edge, where did you push on the door? In the middle, hint. What's the principle? Couldn't get it. So eventually I said, torque. And he says, oh. He trots out the equation, and he actually does the whole thing, plugging in numbers and saying, oh, and you're like, yeah, it would be much easier if you push at the edge of the door. And I looked at him and he said, you really didn't know that? He said, no. John could not link what he was learning in class to anything in the real world. And that became one of the inspirations that my wife and I used in writing our book, Sparks of Genius. John's very successful as a physician. He actually has an MD and a PhD, but he has never invented anything. He's added nothing new to medicine. He's a genius, but he's not creative at all. Now, the problem here is that Korea produces many Johns. You are at the top of all these tests. Tim's, PISA. But what's the relationship between doing well on tests and creativity? The answer is none. 
Lewis Terman, who invented the IQ test, actually tested this. He took a whole bunch of geniuses, people with IQs over 140, people who got the highest test scores on math, science, language, and found that they did no better and often worse than people with lower IQs. And this result has been verified many, many times by other researchers. And in fact, there are many counterexamples. And I'll show you one. These are people who have Nobel Prizes with IQs in the 120s. That's probably the average IQ in this room. You all have the IQ to be a Nobel Prize winner. Here's an example. Louis Alvarez invented the bubble ch chamber, which allows physicists to watch subatomic particles. He was tested by Louis Terman did not get into his genius category. And interestingly, his father sent him not to the academic high school where you would expect a genius to go, but to a technical high school. And the reason was that Louis Alvarez loved to take things apart, put them together, improve equipment, play with electronics. And his father reasoned that he could learn anything he needed to know academically from a textbook. But the only way he could learn to be an inventor was to actually work with machines, equipment, and tools. It paid off. He became the greatest inventor of new physics equipment ever. Here's another example, Robert R. Wilson. Not only a physicist who designed super colliders, but also a sculptor, the actual architect of Fermi Lab, which you see here. And he said that when he made a super collider and designed it, he used exactly the same ways of thinking that he used when he was making a sculpture. The two are the same. Now, there's an important lesson here because Korea separates students very early into academic tracks and technical or vocational education. And what I've just shown you is that people who are extremely creative in physics often have both. So John, who couldn't do any of these things, is not creative, very academic. Whereas Alvarez and Wilson, who went technical ways, are the ones that we now know. My wife and I, Michelle Root Bernstein, have done studies and I won't go into the details here, but basically these graphs show that when you look at who files the most patents in the National Academy of Engineering in the United States or among graduates of my university, it's not the ones with the highest grades or any of those things. It's the people who have avocations or formal training in metallurgy, ceramics, electronics, lots of crafts. So the creativity lessons here are very simple. You have to be smart enough to master your particular profession, but you don't have to be smarter than that. It's not the smarts that make you creative, it's what you bring to your job that's unique different from everyone else, that allows you to solve problems they can't. Lots of people could do math, but very few had Alvarez's or Wilson's artistic and mechanical skills. That's what they brought that was unique. So one of the things you should think about for yourself, one thing that you can change if you want to, is what makes you unique. Myth four. Creativity is problem solving. Hmm. We look at creative products, we know that somebody's creative because we see what they've done. But is that where the creativity actually comes from? I think not. Let me give you an example from arthroscopic surgery. Basically, if you had a knee problem 20 or 30 years ago, they would cut your knee open, six or eight inch incision, open it up, and then they'd have to go in and figure out how to fix it. Then they'd sew you up, and you would be in the hospital for a week or two trying to recover. 
Then somebody invented arthroscopic tools, which are basically little robots with visual fibers in them so that you can make a little tiny incision, look inside, actually do your surgery through a little set of holes, fix it, and the patient can actually leave the hospital the same day. It's miraculous. It's much better. So, once people learned how to do that on knees, surgeons started saying, what else can we use it for? How about stomach surgery, lung surgery, gallbladder surgery? And then they came to a real tough one, which was kidney surgery. Now, on the left-hand side, you can see what happens when you open up the stomach, which is the normal way that they were doing kidney surgery. All you see are intestines, liver, stomach. There's all sorts of organs in the way. So a surgeon would literally have to open up the entire belly, open it up, move the organs aside to get to the kidneys, which are hiding at the back under everything. When they tried to do arthroscopic surgery, they then had to somehow thread all of those little tools through little tiny incisions all the way through everything to the back. Instead of being miraculous and better, patients were on the surgical table twice as long. Many of them started dying from too much anesthetic. Because they were in surgery for so long, they got many more complications, infections. And eventually, after about five years, the surgeon said, forget it. It's impossible. We can't do this. We will not accept any papers about this subject anymore. We will not let anybody talk at a conference. We're putting a moratorium on all research having to do with arthroscopic surgery on kidneys. It's the end. Now, eventually the problem got solved. But not because somebody did anything that I've been talking about. It's because someone rethought the problem. The problem isn't how to use arthroscopic surgery. The problem is, how do you get to the kidney efficiently? Nobody was thinking about that until about two years later, a young intern, a very young man with almost no surgical experience at all, came to a conference and he said, give me two minutes, I'll tell you how to solve the problem. The senior surgeons laughed at him and said, no, you know, that's ridiculous. He said, no, I've got the solution. They said, no, you're going to embarrass yourself. All the experts have tried. It doesn't work. He said, that's my lookout. If I make a fool of myself, my career, let me try it. He said, okay, try it. 